Well, thank you very much, uh, Nicolas, for spending a little bit of time in your very busy schedule. I just learned that you have to, to uh, dash back to, to Berlin very soon. So my, my first question, um, you are the, the head of the Berlin Institute for Medical Systems Biology, mm -hmm. Medical Systems Biology. Uh, so what are the challenges to, to bring clinical people, computational biologists, experimental biologists? Do they understand well? How do you do it? So I think the, the key is to build a place or places where um, the spirit is, is really there in daily life and, and will bring young people uh, of the next generation basically um, in a good uh, setting together. But, uh, and I think this is also true for, for clinicians, but uh, the institute you're talking about, the Berlin Institute for Medical Systems Biology, is part of the Max Delberg Center, so it's like a new branch. Um, and the Max Delberg Center has a long history of connecting basic science and uh, clinical sciences. Uh, so um, there are already a number of clinicians really working on campus doing uh, uh, basic uh, research. And there are a number of activities to really connect the two. I think the Max Delberg Center is special in this case. And it's, I think, one of the reasons why this new institute uh, now bringing computation uh, together with these two components um, might be really an interesting place for the, for the future. Turning now to your work on the regulation of gene expression by microRNAs, or coding RNAs, how does it feel to discover a whole new layer of regulation? Is it like going on a new planet, uh, being a pioneer? Or? Well, you know, there were many labs uh, 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 involved in this, um, but uh, I must say that especially the first uh, years were uh, really, um, they just went very quickly. I, I mean, sometimes I have a hard time to even remember um, how everything went because so many things happened in such a short time. It was a time of, uh, well, what can I say, um, feeling very adventurous and um, with many new horizons coming up. It's also very interesting for me to see now, um, when I started working on microRNAs, there were perhaps 20 papers published. They're now um, just um, eight years uh, after that, there are over 10,000. Altogether, uh, it has been very fruitful in, in, in many regards. I think we are looking uh, at a way of gene regulation that we that is for all times changed. It has changed, I think, in a, in a profound way. Um, just talking about microRNAs, um, what uh, several labs, including our own, found in early on was that microRNAs regulate a major part of the human genome in a, of human genes in a functionally important way. And uh, so now you have uh, um, clinicians uh, talking about the function of microRNAs in, in, in stroke, in, in regeneration of heart muscles uh, after a stroke. It really went a, right, so th there was an initial boom, and, but now it has become very uh, specific for, for in, in many situations, very diverse, um, and I think has opened up uh, also uh, not only fundamental ways how to think about gene regulation, but also in terms of applications, just many new things. Because remember, if, you, uh, if you're talking about a microRNA and you interfere with the microRNA, you're not interfering with the DNA directly, so it's not gene therapy, it's, it's more like acting on an intermediate step. And microRNAs typically uh, have mild effects on an uh, individual target that they regulate. So you're not, you're not also taking a hammer and, and destroying things, but, but you have maybe the ability to interfere with what microRNAs are naturally doing in many cases, which is tuning um, of levels um, mm -hmm. rather than uh, making uh, strong responses. There are exceptions to this, but should be very clear on this. Uh, some microRNAs do trigger on and off switches uh, during development, for instance. So molecular biology, by tradition, is a very empirical science, experimental science. Now, can you tell us a bit what was the impact of computational biology uh, in, the, in the discovery of, of microRNA and their biology? Well, uh, I'll 
give you an example. In 2001, uh, several labs uh, discovered that there are hundreds of different microRNA genes in animal genomes, including our own genome. Okay. So the human genome has, uh, we know now, at least 600 different microRNAs. Then, of course, everybody was wondering, what do these microRNAs do? And for this to understand, uh, you have to understand a single microRNA, a single strip of RNA, what does it recognize uh, of all the messenger RNAs in the genome, which places does it recognize and bind to. And really, purely computational approaches uh, um, gave the insight that a single human microRNA regulates hundreds of target genes, and these target genes were to some degree um, identified precisely. Okay. You, this year, I think you, you published a very nice uh, little review entitled uh, Microarrays in the, in the Operon paper. Okay. And there you remind us that uh, Jacob and Mono proposed two models for gene uh, regulation, a transcriptional one and also a post-transcriptional one. You have the feeling that the model one was overemphasized, the, the importance of transcriptional regulation over the last uh, few decades. First of all, uh, we should be happy that Jacob and Mono already decided that model one was a correct model for their case. Um, so um, that you know, brought research into the right uh, direction. And of course, transcriptional gene regulation, which is model number one, uh, is of uh, fundamental importance uh, to life. And it's also the primacy of gene regulation, if you will, because uh, first you transcribe a gene and then you start with model two, which is uh, post-transcriptional uh, gene regulation. So I think it's way too early to, you know, to make a big call. I think it's, it's also not the way it works. I think the way it works is that both models have their own right uh, importance and also interactions. One should not forget that any kind of um, gene that, well, most genes that, that regulate uh, transcription are regulated themselves on the post-transcriptional level and genes which regulate others on the post-transcription level are also regulated on the transcriptional level. So both things really uh, go together and I think I try to really make the point in, in my small um, uh, review or perspective that I think it's really now about trying to tie both levels together. And with, with the, the new technologies, functional genomics or, or proteomics, is it possible to have a more quantitative and dynamic look at the central dogma, the contribution of transcription, transcription rates, uh, half-life rates? Yes, so uh, I think this is very exciting. So it must be said that um, the, also as another answer to your previous question, I think the technologies to study Model 2 mm -hmm. are now really in place. Uh, it's, for technical reasons, just a little more difficult to work with uh, RNA and uh, RNA prone interactions. And this, it just has been difficult for a long time and I think just as of a couple of years this is now possible in a, in a um, systematic um, way. So colleagues at the Max Delbrück Center just published, I think, a quite uh, impressive paper where really they measured copy numbers, concentrations of mRNAs of proteins and half lifetimes of mRNAs and of proteins for um, a human cell line. And it's really the first time, and believe it or not, 50 years after the Jacob and Manor paper and, and after all the molecular biology that we have actually an impression how the fundamental players in the, uh, in the big dogma are actually expressed and, and how are they behaving in, in, in just in terms of copying how many molecules per cell, what are the synthesis rates and what are the turnover rates because they must balance each other in a stationary state. So the whole thing is, is maybe now starting. Uh, and turning to another technological platform, uh, next generation sequencing platform, um, the, the cost of sequencing has dropped massively, the yeah. performance of the techniques have increased massively. So what sort of new opportunities does it offer and maybe also what are the challenges? Yes, so uh, I think the opportunities are just mind-boggling. Okay? And um, I think 
we should all face it, uh, it I think it's very clear that in some years, five years, ten years, who knows, but it will come that sequencing um, of, let's say, part of your tissue um, or if you have a tumor or maybe just as a protective um, um, assay will come. So this really goes into personalized medicine because it means looking at an individual and his individual uh, risk factors uh, or diseases in an in a individual way. And it's already now clear, I mean, if you look into the cancer literature, uh, that the sequencing is really uh, changing uh, the way that, uh, that we can deal with uh, cancer in all ways. So from classification of, uh, of, of cancer, but also uh, in terms of um, uh, prognosis. On all levels, you, you, you'll find uh, that this is changing the way that I think in the future um, going to a doctor will look like. Now, this is, John, this is just one application, which is maybe f for many people one of the most central ones because it's, it's about our health. Talking about basic science, it changes everything. I mean, so, so the way to quantify molecules is, is, is becoming very precise, accurate, and just end of story. Okay? So you can really, in terms of computations, it's just fantastic because you can, you can really start to, to think about putting things together in a, in a uh, well, mathematically well-defined way. Challenges, I think it's, well, the challenge right now is not so much the sequencing itself, um, the challenge is really to handle the data. Um, so the cost of sequencing is dropping, that's true, but the cost of the analysis is, is going up, okay, because of the people who, who can do the analysis are, um, of course, uh, everybody wants to hire them, so they, uh, they become more and more expensive. I mean, I'm putting this in a slightly uh, funny way, but really already now the cost for analyzing the data and thinking about the data, handling the data is higher than the sequencing cost on its own. Now on a, on a more personal level, uh, you had to decide between theoretical physics and biology, between music and science, between New York and Berlin. Uh, were these difficult decisions? Uh, yes, indeed. <laughs> but I'm, I'm, I'm very happy that I, I don't regret a single one of them. Uh, one question I have to, to, for scientists to play also music. Musicians, they, they work on their emotions, they work with their body to play the music on, on an instrument. And scientists typically they sit and they think rationally. Do you think these are two separate worlds for you, or do they help each other? For me, they certainly help each other, um, that uh, for sure. But I think the, the, the picture of a scientist sitting somewhere and, and thinking is, is only partially correct. I think more commonly you will find the scientist uh, in the uh, coffee corner, uh, talking passionately, arguing passionately with another scientist. There's a lot of passion uh, and emotion and creativity uh, important in science. I think it's needless to say that um, all the great discoveries came by people who, who were thinking outside the box or, or did you know, chance experiments or, or something. You cannot plan discoveries, it doesn't make any sense.